Today, we are going to start about the discussion on uh, the one party of Green's function. And tomorrow, we will uh, introduce the GW approximation for the calculation of the single particle in uh, Green's function. So, in a sense, today we give a, a twist to the school because instead of talking about density functionals, we will talk about functionals of the single particle of this function. And we will go back to the mini body problem, the Schrodinger equation, where we have a static Hamiltonian, so there is no time dependent external potential. Uh, can you read here? Yeah. Okay. And uh, on Monday, you have already discussed why we don't want to solve this equation, right? Yes or no? <laughs> why we don't want to, to solve this equation? Because in principle, if we calculate the minimal function, we can calculate all the observables that we want, right? They are simple functionals of uh, the minimal wave function. Why we don't want to do so? Why you do density functional theory? Why? Why is it too complicated? Because of the electron electron interruption. <clears throat> yes. And so, what's the consequence of this? That the number of variables increases. Yeah, because we, in general, we want to solve a mini body problem, but the number of electrons is very large. We are typically interested in um, extended systems, solids, where the number of, uh, or number of electrons can be the Avogadro number of particles, so very large. So this object is depending on a very large number of, of uh, variables, and it depends on n. So if you increase the number of particles, the number of degrees of freedom of this object is increasing. Okay, this is the first reason. And the second reason is another one that maybe we don't need it. Because we are, after all, we are not interested in the calculation of the minimum wave function. We don't care about the minimum wave function. We cannot measure it, right? What we want to calculate at the end is just an observable. An observable is a functional of the minimum wave function. And in particular, it's an expectation value of uh, the minimum wave function. So expectation values are always large integrals. So when you calculate the integral, you throw away a lot of information. So it's a very complicated object to calculate. It's basically impossible to store this object. And we don't need it because what we want to calculate are observables. And observables are large integrals of uh, the many wave function, of operators calculated on the many wave function, right? So what we do, we do DFT. And in DFT, density functional theory, we know that the same observable can be calculated as a function of the density, right? This is what we have seen on, on Monday. And of course, the functional is different. It's a different functional. This is a simple functional of a complicated object, right? If you want an observable, you give me the operator, I can calculate this in principle. I know it. This is a complicated functional of a simple object, the density. And the density is something we like. It's a quantity that we like because it's simple. Why this object is simple? I didn't do anything. Why this object is simple in contrast to the minimum wave function? Just leave it. Yes, it, it's independent on the number of particles. It's always a function of the uh, variable, the position. Okay, and it's a reduced quantity. It's what we call a reduced quantity. Okay, so we want to explore this fact. The problem is that uh, for most of the observables we are interested in, we are not able to calculate the function because we don't know the expression. Okay. 
for most of the, of the observables, we don't know the function. So we know using Consham, the Consham scheme, how to calculate this quantity in principle, the density. But then we have the problem that we cannot calculate the observables we are interested in very often. Okay. Any other consideration on DFT? Why you are here if you are satisfied with DFT? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Why we like DFT or why we don't like DFT? Other remarks. We are just work in the ground space. Hmm? You cannot calculate excited property with. I don't agree because DFT is telling us that there is a one to one relation between the density and the external potential, right? This is the only very good theorem, which means that there is also one to one correspondence between the density, the ground state density, as you say, and the Hamiltonian function or the Hamiltonian. So, in principle, even the excited state properties are functionals of the ground state density. In principle, the only limitation is that the Hamiltonian is static. But again, we don't know the functionals. So we are stuck. Any other consideration on DFT? The DFT is limited with uh, accuracy of the uh, uh, exchange correlation function. Yes, this is always the case. We don't have any exact theory for the minibody problem. So we, are, we have always to make approximations. If you like, the consideration that we can make is that it's not so obvious to improve with respect to existing approximations. It's very difficult to devise a systematic approach to go beyond the standard approximations that we have in, uh, uh, for the consham exchange correlation potential. That's all. Okay, as you have already understood, Today, uh, it's meant to be a discussion, an interactive discussion. And I hope that also people online will interact. I don't know if this is going to work, but this is typically what we want to do in this, uh, in this, uh, using this lot of, of time. Because tomorrow, you will have uh, the opportunity to listen to Matteo Giantomassi that will tell you how to do a GW calculation in practice. So today we are focused on concepts, no difficult equations to understand, but of course it's very important to get through the concepts and the key ideas of the um, theoretical approaches that we are going to use. So sit back, relax, okay? It's just meant to, to, to be a discussion. And your point of view is very important. So whenever you want, stop me, complain if I tell you something you don't agree about ask questions. So the plan is that today we are going to introduce the one part of Green's function. And this one part of Green's function is going to be our key variable that will replace the density as the fundamental object that we use to build functions of. It's as the density, it's a reduced quantity. It's independent of the number of particles. So if you have 1 million electrons, it's always the same function, like density, it's always the same function. And um, so we will start by discussing why we do what we do, as we are already doing. And then I will uh, give you some uh, further motivation why the one particle Green's function is interesting. It's a quantity that we want to calculate. So you will be really motivated to come back tomorrow because tomorrow we will discuss the standard approximation that is the GW approximation to calculate the one particle Green's function. And on Friday, Francesco will discuss about two particle Green's functions and the beta separator equation that is an in principle exact equation to calculate correlation functions in linear response. So it's the equivalent of uh, time dependent density functional theory in the language of Green's functions. Okay. So you have already understood that if you don't ask questions, I will ask questions to you. Okay. So please be awake.
so we will start really from from the basic and the basic uh, would be really um, to ask this i will tell you later at the end what is one electron okay of course this is a trivial question it's not trivial if you are in a many body system if you have a system of n electrons and i want to define what is one electron what is the best definition for one electron in a system of n electrons and this is and this is uh, something that has to be related to on a, an operative definition so the question is how do we measure the properties of one electron in a system of n electrons in a solid any idea marginalization of many body wave function if you're talking about mm -hmm. margin, marginalization so you have to tell this to an experimentalist so how do you measure it uh, what like, is the marginalization how do you measure okay, it uh, i would uh, integrate the many body wave function on single electron operators mm -hmm. and in practice uh, how do you rela integral? realize this integral integral of the many body wave function yes, i understand this from the mathematical point of view but in reality uh, i mean the many body wave function is an object that we like because it's a solution of uh, the Schrodinger equation. But experimentalists don't see the many body wave function, right? So we are looking for an operative way to measure one electron in a uh, many body electron system. Maybe you could discriminate with some kind of intensity criteria? Like um, intensity means okay. some spectroscopy, some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have fundamental properties of one electron that you can measure as charge. Charge? Mm -hmm. And you can relate that somehow to some current. So I, I don't know in the lab, specifically the experiment we're doing, it will change, but I think it should be related to some intensity measurements. Of electric intensity, I mean, I think of current. Okay, yes. And indeed, this is called theoretical spectroscopy lectures because we want to do spectroscopy, so I agree. Okay, I, I think there is, yeah, but. You have to take the electron out of the system. For instance, yes. So one suggestion comes from the audience. Okay. For the mission. Photo emission, which is what you suggest as well. Who is in the audience? Mike. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Yes. And indeed, this is what I'm also going to suggest you to use photo emission. And I guess on Monday, Simo has already introduced photo emission to you. I'm not pretending that this is the only way or the best way to measure one electron properties in. A system of many particles, many electrons, like a solid, but it's a way, it's an approximate way to measure or to define in the best possible way what is one electron in a many electron system. So, what is direct foot emission? And I should have the point here. Yes, no. Here. Yeah. But I'm not able to use it. So, okay. in direct photoemission, we can with, with the photon and we use the energy of the photon to uh, emit one electron from the system. And we measure the total energy difference between the system in the ground state with n electrons and the system with n minus one electrons in a state J. And we call this energy difference, total energy difference, as the energy EJ. And we associate this energy to the energy of the electron that was uh, inside the system. The same is for inverse photoemission, where we add one electron to, to the system, and we measure the total energy difference between the system in the ground state with n electrons and the system with n plus one electrons in the state J. And we call this uh, energy difference Ej. 
And uh, in direct photo emission, we measure occupied states. We have to remove one electron from the system. And in inverse photo emission, we measure unoccupied states because we have to uh, fill an empty level. And we call these energies addition and removal energies. One electron addition and removal energies. And this is uh, what we are going to target uh, in, this, uh, in this discussion. And this is what the GW approximation is meant to reproduce. Okay. You have seen this on, on Monday, right? Yes. Okay. Very good. What about DFT? What is one electron in DFT? Have you ever seen a Kunsham electron in your life? Have you ever met a Kunsham electron in your life? Why not? That's okay. You mentioned the Yes, they are fictitious particles that are meant to reproduce the exact ground state density. But they cannot be associated uh, to additional removal energies. Good. Everybody agrees on this? But, but still, the, the density is observable and can be measured. Yeah. Exactly, yes. But as it is written here, the density is a collective variable. You cannot associate the density to a single electron. What is the density? Density is the probability to find any of the n electrons inside the system at the position R. So you cannot distinguish still all the electrons. And it's a many body variable indeed. Without Consham, the definition of the density is this complicated integral, right? You need to know the many body wave function. And indeed, we introduced Consham. Uh, because it also we want to avoid to use this expression to calculate the density. Mm -hmm. How many of you are familiar with second quantization? Mm -hmm. Yes, have you ever seen second, the second quantization formalism? Mm -hmm. The others don't understand the second line, then, right? Who doesn't understand the second line formally? Okay, for all the others, is, this is clear. <clears throat> okay, so for those of you that know the second quantization formalism, I'm, I've just rewritten the density using field operators, um, creation and annihilation operators. And this is an expectation value with respect to the minimum wave function in the ground state that I call N. Okay, so this n is just this pra n is just this mini body wave function. Now, um, the good thing about second quantization is that it's very intuitive to understand. Of course, it's a, it's a different language, so we have to learn about the mathematical rules. And if you want to use Green's functions and second quantization in practice, you have to learn this language, this mathematical language. But to follow the discussion today, we don't need it, okay? It's just important to make the connection with the, their uh, physical meaning. And their physical meaning is that this operator, this field operator, is removing one particle at the position R. And this other operator, so this is called annihilation. And this operator with the dagger is called creation operator. It's creating one particle at position R. So we are in a formalism where we change the number of particles, okay? And this is something that has to do with counting the particles. When you count something, you have objects all around. What do you do? You pick an object, you remove it, and then you put it back. You are counting particles, okay? Indeed, the density is nothing else than the expectation value of the number operator. Like we are counting particles and we are counting particles at position R. The second quantization in the field operators are just a, a synthetic way of taking into account uh, the anti symmetry of the mini body wave function. So they respect commutation rules and anti commutation rules in the case of fermions that, uh, encoded, that have encoded uh, these uh, 
anti-symmetry, these fermionic properties of the bit value function. But we don't need to know much more than, than this today. Okay, so in the following, and the Green's function is defined in terms of uh, these operators. So in the following, I will use just this language, which is just uh, intuitive as I, I, have, I have told you. Is this clear? Fine. Can you follow? Okay. So this, I think Gianmarco has shown you on Monday. It's a typical uh, illustration of the failure of Kosham DFT to calculate uh, band gaps in materials. And it's the typical uh, motivation why we want to, to, to go beyond Kosham DFT. Why LDA Kosham DFT is not good at, as a calculation of band gaps in semiconductors? You told me that you have already seen this on Monday, so you know. BXC is local. Mm -hmm. So? So it doesn't work with the band structure. Because we need some local exchange correlation. Mm -hmm. And OK, from the physical point of view, I agree. Mathematically, it's, it's a, a good consideration. From the physical point of view, Uh, from the non-local actually, we have the, the electron is non-local. What do you mean? Depends on the other. Uh, well, but this is just the Coulomb interaction. <laughs> it's just the fact that you have the interaction between two electrons at any distance. Okay. But you have already said this uh, before. It's the fact that the Kosham electron is an invention. It's something that uh, we need to introduce if we want to have an efficient way to calculate the ground state density, right? So the Kosham electrons are just meant to be used to obtain the ground state density. So the Kosham eigenvalues don't have a physical meaning except for the almost the highest occupied level in the final system. That is related to the decay of the density in the asymptotic regime, right? So even if you have the exact VXC, imagine that I give you the exact VXC of silicon, which is uh, which is here. Where is silicon? There is no silicon. Yeah, yeah it's here. Okay. Imagine that I I, I have the exact VXC of silicon. What is the band gap? That I would obtain. Yes, exactly. It would be not far from the LDA. And this I can tell you because we have done it. We have uh, inverted the density calculated in Quantum Monte Carlo. So the same way we use to calculate the orange electron gas that we use in LDA. So we think that it's, it's accurate. And from this, we can invert the consumption equation and calculate the corresponding VXC. We have done so for silicon, and then we can solve the consumption equations and calculate the band gap as the consumption uh, eigenvalue difference. And it turns out that LD8 is not very far from, uh, from this value. And this was a result that was already discussed in the 80s by Rex Godby, Sham, and Schluter using the Sham, the Sham Schluter equation. It is an exact relation between the self energy, the Green's function, and the exchange collision potential. Okay. And we have seen yesterday with Valerio, we deleted. Okay. The exact. Yes, that's true. Valerio has calculated everything basically for uh, helium, right? So that's exactly a, with the 22 decimal. That's a very important <laughs> benchmark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you have one question I would like to ask is when you call here experimental band gap, mm -hmm. these are again the ones measured in photo emission yes. spectroscopy. Yes, you have to combine direct and inverse photo emission. That's the band gap. Then, of course, there are problems in extracting the band gap from, from direct and inverse photo emission. 
um, you have to make assumptions. Uh, if you like, we can discuss this uh, separately. And on the theoretical side, we do calculations at t equals zero, and we live at finite temperature, luckily. Okay, so this was just to say that the Cronsham uh, gap is not something that we can use to calculate these uh, energy differences. And in particular, we cannot use uh, Cronsham eigenvalues to calculate additional removal energies. In principle, in DFT, we could still calculate these total energies. And if we were able to do so in a solid, we would be able to calculate uh, total energy differences. But we don't do this in general. In general, what we do is just we calculate Cronsham eigenvalues and then we plot band structures. And then we compare with the experiment, we calculate the band gaps, and they are not in good agreement with the experiment. But we should we should not blame DFT for this. Right, we should we should not blame Con and Sham for this. Okay, time to introduce the one particle difference function. So the definition is up there, and um, you see that the one particle difference function is called G, and it's a function of x1, x2, t1, and t2. So it's a more uh, complicated object than the density. X1 and X2, in principle, stand for position R1 and spin uh, sigma 1 and uh, position R2 and spin sigma 2. But in the following, we will uh, uh, focus on in the discussion on materials where the spin polarization is not important. So we will uh, consider X1 as position R1. So it's an object that depends on two variables in space and it depends on two variables in time, t1 and t2, okay? The density is an object that depends on r. So this is more complicated. And it's defined as an expectation value. We are considering temperature zero, okay? As in the case of ground state DFT. And it's an expectation value of field operators creation and annihilation operators with respect to the many body wave function that is written with this bra and, and cat n. And there is this uh, T that stands for a time ordering operator. It's just a synthetic way of writing these two lines that is that are displayed uh, just down here. Okay. And explicitly, we have two possibilities. If time uh, T1 is larger than time T2, or time one is uh, earlier than uh, time T2, okay? And this time, order operator, time ordering operator is uh, adding a plus or minus sign according to this uh, time ordering. And it's ordering uh, the operators inside the matrix element this expectation value, uh, having the time on the right, that is the earliest time. So it's reading uh, in second quantization is like reading Arabic language. You have always to start from the right and go to the left. First operator is on the right, okay? And the second operator is on the left. So you go in this way. If you are not familiar with Arabic, okay, you can cope with it, I hope. Um, why does the minus sign? Yes, this is just, it it's just uh, because we are considering fermions. Okay. And this is related to the anti-commutation rules that I was referring to uh, before. So it's just a way to, uh, that we use to, keeping, to keep track of these uh, fermionic rules. But the, for us here, the important thing is that using this time ordering operator, we combine two different definitions in once, in only one definition. In practice, we have two definitions according to the time, T1 larger than T2 or T1 smaller than T2, okay? And the difference is the position of the operators. 
And if T1 is smaller than uh, T2, we have to switch the operators. And every time we switch the operators, we add a minus sign. If T1 is larger than T2, then T2 is already in a good position. We don't have to do anything. These operators are already ordered according to this convention. First operator is acting on the right. So this is already good. Okay. Do you accept this definition? Not yet. Uh, are we working the the, the, the um, direct or Schrodinger picture for these field operators? Okay, these field operators are in the Eisenberg picture, and you see that they depend on time. Indeed. Okay. And uh, actually, again, it's the language of uh, field operators. And um, to to go into into the mathematical details, we have to to use this this language. Uh, second question, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, before we were talking about the definition of the gap, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, in DFT we were focusing on uh, some sort of uh, time independent theory, yes. at least for the definition that we had uh, in the previous slide. And I was wondering now that we introduced time in the non equilibrium approach. Uh, we are not focusing on that, right? No, or no. we are doing some sort of adiabatic consideration for this electron that are. Uh, Let's say taken out and then reintroduced into the mm -hmm. state. So we are in our case, I think Claudio on Friday may discuss about non-equilibrium dysfunction theory, where you generalize this definition for non-equilibrium. In so it, in the general uh, case would be the Hamiltonian with the time-dependent external potential. In our case today, we are we are stick to, to this uh, time-independent Hamiltonian. So it's a good observation. In this case, we still introduce time, even though in principle there is no okay. need to have a definition of the use of time. And why should it be important whether you create and destroy or destroy create? Thank you for the question. <laughs> this is the answer. Because depending on the fact that you create or uh, destroy first the particle, you are describing two different situations. Let's start from the situation on the left. With the same result. Oh. Sorry? With the same result. Oh. With the same? And it's a different processes, but with the same result at the end. No, with one. we are describing two different situations. With the same object, the one particle Green's function here, <coughs> that is explicitly, sorry, Defined here with the two with these two definitions, we are describing two different uh, situations, and the two different situations are illustrated here. Okay, let's start from the process on the left that corresponds to the case t1 larger than t2. So the operators are already ordered correctly here, and we have first a creation uh, operator. So we are creating an electron at position R2 and time T2. That is the first uh, thing that is happening because T2 is smaller than T1. And we are creating this uh, additional electron in this C. So this is represented, this C is uh, represented by this pink square of the N electron in the system, in the ground state. And then we remove this electron at position R1 and T1. R1 is different than T2, than R2, and T1 uh, is later than T2. Okay. So what are we describing here? We are describing a propagation of one additional electron from position R2 and time T2 to position R1 and time T1. Okay. We are taking an expectation value, it means that we are measuring the probability amplitude of observing this uh, propagation of this additional particle in the system. And if you think about this expression, it's just telling us that we are calculating the overlap of the wave function, where we have uh, added one particle, removed one particle with respect to the ground state. So it's a probability amplitude. 
Similarly, in the second case, if T1 is earlier, <coughs> earlier than uh, T2, we have to switch the operators here because the first is on the right. So we have this minus sign. And how do we read this? We destroy one electron at position R1 and time T2. So we create one additional pole, one additional positive charge in the system. We let the system evolve in the presence of this additional hole until position R2 and time T2. So on the left, we are describing the, pro the propagation of one additional electron in the system. On the right, we are describing the propagation of one additional hole in the system. And this is reminding us additional removal uh, of uh, electrons in the system. They are measured respect respectively by direct photo emission and inverse photo emission. Actually, by inverse photo emission and direct photo emission. In inverse photo emission, we add one electron to the system of n electrons. In direct photo emission, we remove one electron from the system of n electrons, so we create one additional hole. And the Green's function is indeed, the single particle Green's function is indeed describing this propagation of additional particles in the system. Okay. Of course, to go into the mathematical details, we need a bit more of time and um, we need to use this language of second physics. But the physical meaning of the one particle Green's function is the propagation of one additional particle, either one, electron or one hole in the system of n electrons that were in the ground state we, because we are at equilibrium. The generalization to non-equilibrium case would be um, with the time dependent Hamiltonian or starting from um, a state that is not the ground state, but it would be the same meaning. The important consequence of uh, the fact that we are in the ground state is that the Green's function doesn't depend separately on T and T2, on T1 and T2, sorry, but it depends just on the time difference T1 minus T2. And I guess that you have already seen this in linear response with uh, Valerio, right? You have seen that the response function chi, that is in principle a function of T1 and T2, if you are in the ground state, depends only on T1 minus T2. And this is why you can mm, take the Fourier transform and you can go from time to frequency space, right? It means that it doesn't uh, matter when you add the particle here, the time when you add the particle, what, it, what is mattering here is just the time difference between the moment where you add the particle and the moment where you remove it. That's the meaning of time in, uh, in this case. Are you lost in the sea of the N electrons or uh, still alive? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. What I'm just wondering is that uh, the definition of the green function is just the same than the total quantization expression for the density. It's not the same, but with one i. It's similar. Yes. Yes. So why to include the complex unit? Yes, indeed. Thank you for the, the observation. Okay. If we take the diagonal of the Green's function in space and time. So with same space, same R and same T, we have the density. Good observation. So the density in second quantization was defined here. If you compare this with one of the two possibilities, and in particular this one, you have that the diagonal of the Green's function uh, in space and time gives you the density. Indeed, why this is the good situation? Because the density is the density of the electrons. 
So it's the density that is related to the occupied states. And this is the situation we are uh, describing occupied states because we are removing electrons from the system, which means that we have to take care, since we have to take care of the time ordering of the operators, we have to add a plus sign at this uh, second T, because in this way, we select which of the two situations we are dealing with. Okay, and this is the situation we are dealing with in the case of the density. Okay, so the density is the diagonal in space of and time of the uh, Green's functions, of the single particle Green's function. And in the case of the time independent Hamiltonian, this is this density is of course independent of time. So it means that for any t, the density is given by this time difference t and t plus, which is always the same. And we can also obtain the density matrix. Just one second. You have seen the density matrix on Monday or not? No. So do you know about Artie Fock? Yes. Do you have, have you seen Artie Fock on Monday? Yes or no? Yes. So you know that the Fock operator, uh, if, I, if I write here, you, you see, right? Even though I'm very bad. This is the Fock operator, right? It's the density matrix times the Coulomb interaction with the minus sign. Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes? No? Yeah. It's just that on Monday, uh, it has been presented in one of the quantum chemistry yeah. where we can basically okay. So the density matrix in uh, R3 Fock. is just well the product of the single particle orbitals taken at different uh, positions r and r prime you know that the density in consham is just the sum of the square of the orbitals right of the absolute value square of the orbitals so you see that the diagonal of the density matrix is the density. All right. This is uh, valid only if uh, the minimum wave function is a slater determinant, like this, the the Consham slater determinant for density, and the Hartree Fock slater determinant for the density matrix in Hartree Fock. In general, if you go beyond Hartree Fock, the density matrix uh, is different. And uh, you have some uh, complication that is ready to correlation that I will not discuss here. But it's just another useful reduced variable that we can use to build functionals of in the framework of reduced density, um, reduced density matrix functional theory. Yeah, I just, I just want to illustrate the fact that if you take the diagonal in time of the Green's function, and you consider the off diagonal elements in space, you get the density matrix, which means that you can also express R3 Fock in the framework of Green's function theory. And by using this relation, you can make the connection between Green's function theory and DFT, because both Green's functions and DFT give you, in principle, the exact density. Okay? So this is telling us that with the Green's function, that is a more complicated object than the density, you can at least recover the density and everything that you have already discussed in EFT. But you can have something more because you can have the one particle excitation spectra, which is the main motivation why we want to introduce Green's functions. We are interested in 
the one factor oxidation spectra, in particular those that are measured by photoemission experiments. And in the case of DFT, we don't know the functional that is uh, telling us how to calculate the one particle excitation spectra starting from the density, right? We don't know the function. In principle, there exists the functions that is telling me that if you uh, give me the, the density, I can tell you the one particle excitation spectra, but in practice, we don't know it, okay? Instead, in the framework of Green's function theory, we can immediately uh, calculate the one particle excitation spectra if we know that Green's function, the single particle Green's function. Okay. This is also important, but it's uh, not much used. It's the fact that using the one particle Green's function, we can calculate the ground state total energy. It's not used because DFT is much more competitive in terms of uh, trade off between cost and accuracy. Okay. It means that uh, if you have a good approximation for the Green's function, you can calculate the ground state energy, but the cost to do so is much higher than uh, what you would have to pay in the case of DFT. And the improvement in terms of accuracy is not so spectacular for the approximations that we have. Okay, so from just a pragmatic point of view, this is why for most of the applications, we use Green's functions to calculate excitation spectra, one particle excitation spectra. We don't use Green's functions to calculate the density because we use DFT, and we don't use uh, Green's functions to calculate the total energy because we use DFT. But in principle, we could. Okay. Are you motivated to calculate the single particle Green's function or not yet? <coughs> yes. Okay. But I hope you want to stay still for another half an hour or so. So there is more. So here I will uh, I will be pretty fast. This is just a, a illustration. It's the result that one should demonstrate, which is that. <coughs> Uh, from the one particle Green's function, we can obtain the single particle excitation spectra. Okay. So, this is the definition of the single particle Green's function. And if you insert uh, some uh, completeness relations in the Fock uh, space, so in the space where you change the number of particles, you make this Fourier transform from uh, time to space. The Green's function takes this form. At the numerator, you have uh, the so-called Lehman amplitudes that are uh, expectation values, expectation uh, yeah, values of the field operators with respect to wave functions where we have uh, changed the number of particles. And most importantly, at the denominator, you have addition and removal energies. Those that are measured by photoemission. And you see that in this uh, time order formalism, um, you have a, a um, sign of this uh, I eta that is uh, changing according to um, uh, the fact that you are considering occupied or empty states. So if you are above or below the Fermi energy. And I guess that you are already familiar with this I eta uh, variable. So it's all this is uh, expressed for eta going to zero plus because we have already see this, seen this with Valerio in TVFT, right? Yes. Okay. So this is telling us, this expression is telling us that the single particle Green's function has poles at the additional removal energies. So if you are able to calculate the poles of the Green's function, we obtain the additional removal energies. So we obtain band structures, band gaps, and more. Sorry, Raj, I forgot that you had the question something like 10 minutes ago. In this slide, is KGN sign function? Is KGN sign function, yeah. OK. 
So again, the poles of the single particle in this function are the addition and removal energies that are measured by the emission. Okay. Often it's not so convenient to look for a poles of a function. It's more convenient to look at peaks of a function. That's why we do spectroscopy. That's the motivation why we introduce the spectral function that is defined as the imaginary part of a Gillis function with the uh, absolute value because uh, the imaginary part of the Gillis function is changing sign at the uh, Fermi energy in the case of time ordered formalism. Okay, and if you look at this expression here, the imaginary part of this is just written here. Okay, how do we understand this? Well, typically we take matrix elements of this function. It is still a non-local object in space and spin, if you want, in a single particle basis. Okay, in this way. And uh, it means that the spectral function is given by a sum of delta functions that are located at the additional removal energies with some weight. And this weight is given by these uh, matrix elements of these Lehman amplitudes in this uh, single particle basis. Okay, this is the expression that we have. So in particular, in the case that we are in a non-interacting system, the minimum wave function is the slater determinant. The Lehman amplitudes correspond to the eigenfunction of the single particle Hamiltonian. And everything reduced down to the fact that the diagonal element of the spectral function is just a delta peak at the one particle energy that is corresponding to the single uh, particle level that we are uh, describing. Okay, so in case it's we have a non-interacting system, the spectral function is just one delta peak at the position that is the uh, energy that the electron is occupying or the empty level, depending whether we are considered occupied and empty states. In the general case, it's a sum of many different contributions. Like it is uh, represented here. Okay. So this is the spectral function, and this spectral function is just a sum of different uh, components. And these are weighting, uh, they are given the intensity at the different energies. And uh, the spectral function has a shape like this. It's maybe centered uh, around one. Uh, prominent energy, and then it has a distribution. And this is reflecting the many particle character of our system. So in this way, we find the best possible definition of one electron in the system, because we can associate this peak to one electron. But you see that it's a many body concept, because it's formed by many different contributions around one, one prominent peak. Here we are displaying the spectral function for the level i, and you see that it has the sum of different contributions, even though it has a main peak. And we will call this the quasi-particle peak. And in this way, we can associate uh, this to uh, a renormalized electron in a minibody uh, framework. In case, in case we are in the continuum, in a solid, Mathematically, we have to make the analytical continuation go to the second Riemann sheet. Okay, it's very complicated, but uh, you can do it. And uh, just uh, it's very simple from the, the conceptual point of view. We are just adding many, many, many contributions. And at the end, you can trace a continuous line. And you have a curve instead of many, a sum of many contributions as it was before. And then you can associate this uh, shape to an energy that is called here omega zero. And you can associate the width of this curve to uh, 
an imaginary part. So you can associate this also to a lifetime because you know that the width of an excitation is related to the inverse of a lifetime of the excitation. This is a general concept of quantum mechanics. So the difference between this case, that is what was written here, and this is just the fact that we go to the continuum and we have many, many uh, excitations, an infinite number of excitations, and they sum up to form a continuum. Yes. Um, you said that we can associate the mean peak to one electron in the meaning uh, as if we were doing a yeah, direct foot emission. Yes, or direct foot emission. Yeah. Why? Because what we do here, we take, in principle, we have this object, okay, and then we take a matrix element in a single particle basis. So here we, we come with the idea that we are in a single particle picture where the electrons are non-interacting. And if the electrons are non-interacting, then uh, this uh, is just a delta peak, okay? In reality, this, this, the same matrix element is not only one single contribution. It has many contributions, but still we can associate this with one single excitations, but in the many body framework. That's why we, we have the fact that this has a width and this width is associated to a lifetime because this excitation is not staying there forever because there are many particle interactions. Instead, in a single particle uh, framework, no interaction, we have just one delta peak and the lifetime is infinite. Delta peak has a zero width. So the lifetime is the inverse of the, the width, and this is infinite. OK. So you still want to calculate the Green's function, right? I hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, we cannot go for lunch. <clears throat> OK. The problem is that in the definition, we still have the interacting ground state, the minimum degree function. And we said that we don't want to calculate the solution of this Hamiltonian, right? The same problem we have in uh, if the, we can calculate the density if we know the many body wave function, but actually we want to calculate the density without knowing the many body wave function. And here we have the same problem. In the definition that I, I've given you, we have to take an expectation value with respect to the many body wave function. But if I am able to calculate the many body wave function, I don't care about the Green's function. I have already all the, the information, right? So how do we do? So if you read uh, the standard textbook, textbooks for uh, Green's function theory and mini body perturbation theory, what you find is that you can use theorems to uh, write a perturbative expansion of the Green's function in terms of the non-interacting Green's function, and you can write you can write down the perturbative series in terms of the Coulomb interaction, and uh, at the end what you obtain are Feynman, Feynman diagrams. Okay, the Feynman gram diagrams are just a representation of perturbation theory in the Coulomb interaction because you want to express the Green's function in terms of the non-interacting Green's function because you don't know the minimum wave function. Okay. This is the standard way that uh, historically was used to present the calculation of the single particle in this function. And I'm telling you so because we are not going to do that. And uh, the idea is that if you don't know a quantity, if you are not able to calculate directly a quantity, the quantity of your interest, the alternative is that you can think that you can calculate this quantity as a solution of an equation. So you have to derive an equation for which the quantity you want to calculate is the solution. Okay, this is the usual trick that we do in physics. And a possibility is that you can derive what is called the equation of motion for the Green's function, where you calculate the time derivative of the Green's function with respect to the time. So it's a differential equation and you have to impose some boundary conditions. 
And you see that uh, in this uh, equation of motion, you have this time derivative. You have the single particle part of the Hamiltonian. So you have the kinetic uh, operator and the external potential. Then you have the delta uh, term plus a correction that originates from the Coulomb interaction. V is the Coulomb interaction. And uh, G2 is the two-particle Green's function. Here, I have introduced a shorthand notation. And one stands for R1, T1, sigma one, if you have spin. And two stands for R2, T2, and sigma two. Otherwise, the equations are just too long, OK? So what we see here is that the Coulomb interaction is introducing two particle excitations. The two particle Green's function is uh, describing the propagation of two additional particles in the system, OK? Without Coulomb interaction, so this term is 0, the Green's function is just a solution of this differential equation with a, de with a delta function. That's why the Green's function is called the Green's function, actually. It's the resolvent of a differential equation. And uh, I guess that you have seen already uh, Green's functions in the framework of differential equations. OK. In uh, many body physics, the situation is more complicated because there is the Coulomb interaction. So you see that the propagation of one additional particle in the system is creating additional two particle excitation in the systems. It makes sense. You have an additional particle that is propagating, and by Coulomb interaction is creating electronal pairs and other two particle excitations in the system through the, the, the Coulomb interaction. This is, of course, bad news because at the origin we wanted to calculate the one particle Green's function, that is our unknown. But in this way, we have introduced another unknown, the two particle Green's function, that doesn't promise to be simpler than the single particle Green's function. Indeed, it depends on four uh, variables, space, time, and spin variables, because it's the description of the propagation of two additional particles in the system. And if you derive the equation of motion of the two particle Green's function, the three particle Green's function appears. So you obtain a hierarchy of equations that connect the Green's function of one order to a Green's function to the higher order. OK. Before going further, um, can you say some words on the equation of motion, how to get to it? Because it is Schrodinger light. Yes. So what you have to do? You have to calculate the um, time derivative with respect to these operators. And the time derivative of this operator is related to the commutator of the field operator with the Hamiltonian. And then if you work out the uh, commutation between um, um, the, the field operators, you end up this. Again, I'm just giving you the result, but uh, in the references that I've listed at the beginning, I will, I will come back at, at the end, you find all these derivations. But here we are interested in the physics, and the physics is, is clear. If you have an additional propagation of one particle, the physical effect is that through the Coulomb interaction, you have additional uh, many bad excitations in the system. OK, so from the one particle Green's function, you go to the two particle Green's function. From the two particle Green's function, you go to the three particle Green's function, and so on. So we are stuck. And here comes the second trick that we usually do. We postulate that all these many body excitations are encoded in a potential in an effective potential that is called sigma, and it's called the self-energy. If the same trick that we do in uh, Kunsham DFT, we put all the exchange correlation effects into the exchange correlation potential. Here we do something similar. 
we take out the part that we are uh, able to calculate explicitly, that is the single particle part of the Hamiltonian, the R3 part that is related to classical electrostatics, and all the rest is put in this operator, that is the self-energy, that plays the same role of the exchange correlation potential of conscious DST. And it's a non-local object. It depends on two positions and two times. And it's taking into account all the exchange correlation effects. OK. And uh, in Cosham DFT, you know that Vxc is a function of the density. Also, in this case, you will not be surprised that the self energy is a function of the Green's function. So in principle, this is a self-consistent uh, equation to solve because the Green's function is entering here in the input of the self-energy. Okay. Okay, so far, I just told you that this uh, self-energy is playing the role of the exchange correlation potential. So it's describing all the exchange correlation effects beyond the artery Hamiltonian. And uh, okay, what we can do immediately, since everything is just depending on time differences. So the Green's function is depending on T minus T1 minus T2. The self energy also will depend on T1 minus T2. We can make a Fourier transform. We go to the frequency space. And this same equation can be written in this way explicitly in terms of the positions R1 and R2 and frequency. Okay. Again, it's something that you should work out explicitly. And what we see is that the Green's function becomes a resolvent of uh, this expression of this Hamiltonian. And in this Hamiltonian, we have a part that is the R3 Hamiltonian. So capital H now is the sum of the uh, um, single particle Hamiltonian plus the R3 uh, potential. So this is the R3 Hamiltonian plus the exchange correlation effects. And this operator that was non-local in time becomes frequency dependent. So it's dynamical. It depends on the energy, on the frequency. And uh, you should be a bit puzzled about this no? because the Hamiltonian is completely static, our starting Hamiltonian. So where does the frequency dependence of this operator uh, come from? In Consham, you have an operator, the Consham uh, potential, it's static and local. Okay. In Arctic Fog, you have an operator that is non-local, but it's still static. It doesn't depend on the frequency, the Fog operator. Here, correlation is uh, introducing a dynamical dependence of the self-energy. Aren't you surprised of this? Where does the frequency dependence come from? Do you buy it? Trivial for you? I think it comes from the way that we solve this equation, right? Because if you try to look at it as a secular equation, like a determinant, then the solution of the equation enters in the matrix. And then you have the double dependence of the frequency in the solution, right? Yeah, if you like, we start from a frequency dependent object. So it's natural that the corresponding uh, effective potential is also frequency dependent. Yeah. Mathematically, I agree. But physically, where this frequency dependence come from? It comes from the fact that we have made a choice. And the choice is that we don't want to uh, keep track of all the possible many body excitations. If we do so, there is no frequency dependence. There is no effective potential. Okay. If we want to keep track of all the possible many body excitations that are encoded in the two particle Green's function, the three particle Green's function, we don't need the self-energy. And we don't need any frequency dependence. Instead, we make a decision and we want to introduce an effective operator, like in the case of the Consham system. 
And this effective operator is telling us that we want to forget about all the explicit many body excitations. We don't want to know about the particle excitation, the free particle excitation, four particle excitation, and particle excitations. We don't want to keep track of them explicitly. And we fold all these excitation in this object that becomes a frequency dependent object. And this is related also to all the appendic, appendic approaches where you have a big Hamiltonian and you want to just solve explicitly a small part of it. All the effect of all the rest that you don't want to treat explicitly appear as a frequency dependence of the effective operator that you use to solve just a small portion of the problem that you want to solve. Yes. Yeah, and when you pass from the two particle grain function to the, the, the self energy and the one particle grain function, I saw, I, I read that the two particle grain function can be written as multiplication of two one particle grain function. So maybe during this, uh, this transformation of the two particle into one particle grain function, we obtain only one 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 particle grain function. So maybe the other one is linked with the self energy. So maybe the term dependence come in this. Uh, yeah, so far I haven't I have I haven't told you why we calculate things in practice. So so far I've just replaced an unknown that is the two-particle Green's function with another unknown that is the self-energy. Okay. And indeed, there is a relation between the two-particle Green's function and combination of Green's functions. And um, this is also known as Schwinger relation. It's telling us that the two particle Green's function can be written as a product of two Green's function plus the functional derivative of the Green's function with respect to an external potential. Okay, and by using this, you can make a connection between the self energy and the Green's function and the two particle Green's function if you want. So all this, of course, is just rewriting of the same equations. So. Yes, this is the way that you can use to derive the set of equations that uh, relate all these quantities that is known as Eddings equations. And uh, we will not have the time to, to do the derivation together, but this is indeed the, the basis of, of this. What I wanted to underline here is the fact that when we go from this kind of uh, uh, set of equations where we have high order these functions to this equation where we have the self energy that is a generalized potential we are making a choice and the choice is that we don't want to keep track explicitly of these many body excitations we just we are just saying that we want just to calculate explicitly the single particle excitations and all, we want to take into account all the rest as in an effective way so if you like, we are creating a generalized quotient system where the only quantity we are interested in, in this case, is the single particle Green's function. We are not interested in many body, high order excitations to particle excitation, three particle excitations. So if we calculate the Green's function in this way, we don't have a two particle Green's function. Okay. We just want that. And uh, so we, introduce an effective potential that is giving us just what we want. In the same spirit that we, in Consham DFT, we introduce an auxiliary system where the only quantity we are interested in in principle is the density and nothing else. So if you want to calculate the density and you are not interested in the single part of this function, that's enough. I would like to repeat again one sentence that Matteo said, because it would be important. In two days, he said exactly that the two particles Green's function can be written as the product of two Green's function plus something else. So, because the G2 is not just G times G, it's more complicated than that. And so, and this something else in addition, so it's the G2 is equal to G times G plus something else. And this something else is the functional derivative of the Green's function with respect to external potential. Keep in mind that for Friday.
Okay, so what we have seen here is that the inverse of the Green's function is just equal to this Hamiltonian, this generalized Hamiltonian that becomes frequency dependent. So the Green's function is the uh, a resolvent of this Hamiltonian that is frequency dependent. That's the definition of uh, the, uh, the resolvent of uh, an Hamiltonian in general, right? Okay. Are you still okay? Can you remain for another 10 minutes? So I just want to discuss the last point. Fine. You can also stop here, depending on, on you. Fine. Still okay. Not too tired. Okay. What I want to, to discuss in the last 10 minutes is actually something that you have already seen different times. That is the Dyson equation. Okay. You have seen the Dyson equation in uh, TDFT already. And uh, you will see Dyson equations all your life if you do this kind of uh, uh, theories. Because Dyson equations are very powerful to calculate quantities that we want to calculate. Okay. It's a general concept. That's why we'd like to make a point on this. So we have said that if there is no Coulomb interaction, the Green's function is just the solution of this equation without this term. And the non interacting Green's function uh, worth a name, an explicit symbol, and this will be G0. Actually, sorry, uh, this is the R3 Green's function. I have just already to correct myself. So <laughs> the resolvent of the R3 Hamiltonian, this one, without this term, I call G0. Okay, sorry for the confusion. I'm also tired. So, this G0 is just the R3 Green's function that is the solution of this equation where self energy is equal to zero. It's the resolvent of this Hamiltonian where the self energy is zero. Okay, it's just if you give me the R3 Hamiltonian and can calculate the Green's function and I call it G0, this one. And the full uh, many body Green's function is the solution of the first line where there is the self energy, including a single correlation effects. Okay, fine. Then it's possible to demonstrate that the combination of these two equations is just this Dyson equation. Okay, again, I don't do it now, but it's a good exercise uh, to do. And the Dyson equation has always the same form, like this one, okay, that you have seen, for instance, in linear response DFT. You have the quantity that you want to calculate expressed in terms of the quantity that you are able to calculate. In this case, it's the Hart rate Green's function plus a correction. And the correction is this integral, where again, you have the quantity that you are able to calculate. So in this case, the R3 Green's function times a kernel, in this case is uh, the self energy, times the quantity that you want to calculate, in this case, the Green's function. In TDFT, you add chi equal to chi naught times uh, plus chi naught uh, FHXC chi, right? But the structure is always the same. That's why I want to make these uh, two considerations. It's the fact that the structure of the Dyson equation is always the same, okay? And it's very powerful. Why is it very powerful? Well, because this is the structure uh, written schematically and you can expand it, right? You can expand it in terms of G0 because you can insert the solution here, you can expand it. If you resum this expansion, you obtain this. Or if you like, this is the solution and you can expand the solution in this way. And this is telling us that if you make an approximation for the kernel of the Dyson equation, in our case, the self energy, and this can be a low order approximation, then the quantity that you want to calculate will be of higher, higher order. Orders because here you are summing an infinite number of terms. 
So the power of the Dyson equation is the fact that you can make a, a pretty crude approximation to the kernel. And thanks to the fact that you are summing an infinite number of terms in a expansion like this, then the quantity that you are going to calculate will be in general better, hopefully better. Okay. You see that if you stop the expansion here and you make an approximation to the kernel, you don't gain anything, right? It's the same order. But the fact that you are using this expansion with an infinite number of terms can improve the solution. Okay. The same trick we do in the case of TDFT. We approximate the kernel to calculate the density, uh, the, density the, the density response, right? Chi. Again, here we want to calculate the Green's function, but we are not calculating explicitly the Green's function. We are not approximating explicitly the Green's function. We are approximating the kernel of the Dyson equation to calculate the Green's function. And this turns out to be much more powerful. So the GW approximation is an approximation for the self energy in order to calculate the Green's function. As I don't know, the ALDA is an approximation for FXE to calculate chi. Same. Second property is the fact that you can split the kernel of a Dyson equation in two parts. This already you have seen in the case of TDFT, where you split the kernel of the Dyson equation into the Hartree part and the exchange correlation part. The Hartree part is just the Coulomb interaction. And the exchange correlation part is the exchange correlation kernel. Okay. And again, we, we can do the same in the case of uh, Green's function theory. And we can split the uh, self energy into two different parts. Typically, we split the self energy into exchange and correlation. The exchange part of the self energy is nothing else than the FOC operator that you have seen in r FOC. And correlation will be correction to this. Why we do so? It's because typically we are able to calculate some parts uh, better than others. For instance, in TDFT, the functional derivative of the R3 potential with respect to the density is something that we are able to calculate explicitly is the Coulomb interaction. And we approximate on only the remaining part. The same we do here in the case of uh, Green's functions. So we will approximate just one part and we will treat the other part exactly. And again, this is possible for the structure of the Dyson equation, this particular structure. This is equivalent, this expression is equivalent to the solution of these two nested equations where the self energy has been split into sigma one plus sigma two, okay? Again, these two properties are just a consequence of the structure of the Dyson equation. So whenever you recognize this structure, you can be sure that this equation has these properties that are in general something that we exploit. Okay, and uh, that's it for today. So we have seen that the, Green's, the one part of Green's function physically describes the propagation of one additional particle in the system. Why we have introduced this definition? Because we want to describe additional removal energies that are measured by foot emission. And the question that we have as a consequence of this definition is how to calculate the single part of this function if we don't want to calculate the minibody wave function n. Okay. And we have seen that a way to calculate the single particle Green's function is to introduce the Hamiltonian that is now frequency dependent, that contains the classical part, the R3 part, plus a correction that is frequency dependent and describes exchange correlation uh, effects. And the Green's function turns out to be the uh, solvent of this uh, Hamiltonian. And again, here we can make contact with the DFT. So the starting point was the Hamiltonian that we know. 
but we are not able to solve it. Right? This was our starting point. Our conclusion is that it's the Hamiltonian that we are able to solve. And explicitly, we are able to calculate the Green's function. The problem is that this Hamiltonian is unknown, and we have to approximate the Hamiltonian. The same is in Consham. In Consham, we are able to solve the Consham equations. That's uh, why we like them so much. The problem is that we have to approximate the Hamiltonian. Okay. Again, here we are in the same uh, spirit. We decide that we don't like this Hamiltonian that is known because we are not able to solve it. And we go to a different framework where we are able to solve the equations, but the problem is to devise good approximations to the Hamiltonian. Okay. This is in principle exact for the calculation of the single particle Green's function, but in practice, we will have to make approximations to the Hamiltonian, to this effective frequency dependent Hamiltonian. And we will do so by making approximations to the self energy. And uh, approximations to the self energies, so the self energy will be approximations for the Green's function. And uh, this will be the starting point for uh, tomorrow. So if you are still interested in calculating these functions, uh, don't forget to wake up tomorrow morning and to come back tomorrow. We will discuss the physics of the GW approximation together. And then things will become serious with uh, the other Matteo G, Matteo GW, Matteo Giantomassi, that will tell you how to calculate uh, the additional removal energies in the GW approximation explicitly. And then you will have the end zone with a bit where you will do an explicit calculation of the band structure of silicon. Okay. Spot on time. So there is still time for questions. Otherwise, uh, this afternoon, tomorrow, whenever you want.